Well, thank you very much. Uh, they told us to project loud. Uh, so I can speak very loud as a New Yorker. I'm not sure you can all understand my accent. I'll just be reminding you I was born in the borough of Queens. So if anybody wants to make fun of how I speak, I speak the Queens English. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt is also from New York and the others have spent time in New York so we could always translate later. Uh, first off, thank you very much because I'm looking outside. I'm not sure I would have stayed inside and listened to me. So the fact that you didn't go outside, we greatly appreciate it. I don't know if you saw the video, but it actually frames our discussion. So data, can you analyze the data in real time? Screen at speed. As Kevin Plank from Under Armour says, run your company live. Uh, this is all law enforcement. And if somebody asks you in your agency, I'll, I'll phrase this before we do some terms of reference. I need anal uh, some analysis on this data. All of us in this room could say, yep, I can give it to you because they want it for the month of January and it has to be delivered the second week in February. But in this environment, when you want the data and the former deputy at the FBI says, I want it yesterday, does your agency, about 90% of you, I looked at the invite list, about 90% of you work for the federal government. Can you honestly say that your agency can provide that data in real time? That you can run your agency at speed? DHS once challenged CBP, can you screen? So I'll give you the problem. Hopefully Dawn will give you the answer. <laughs> 350 million people arrive into the US each year. That's a million a day. The average time they get to spend on any, every passenger is less than 60 seconds. Can you analyze that in real time? And does CBP have the computing capability to do it? She may not be able to tell you because she's still with CBP. I spent over 30 years there. I'll tell you they don't. They're about to, I think, because Hannah is going in and helping them, but they don't. So one of the main things you need to do is terms of reference, right? You know, is everybody speaking? How many of you have gone into a meeting halfway through and the person you're briefing is like, I thought you were talking about A. It seems like I wanted you to brief me on B. And then that ugly meeting, they get up and walk out and say, come back you know, when you're ready to talk about B. So let's, go with, let's start with our panelists and ask them from their perspective how they define data-driven intelligence. What is data and what does driven intelligence mean? I don't know, so I'm going to get educated. So for, for Matt, how in your world, how do you define data-driven intelligence? Uh, for us, it's adding a degree of empiricism um, to identify trends, to assess policies and procedures, um, and also to monitor outcomes based on changes that you may have created. Um, very often, or historically, we would make a policy change and not know if it worked. We would launch a forget. Uh, so I think the, the data analytics and the different, um, and we, we discuss this, is it data or data? Good. Pick your poison. But, the, um, but I think for us, it also has to be reliable. Uh, we had a, a judge that I worked for who at one time was the New York City Police Commissioner. In his first day on the job, he asked his chief of staff for the crime statistics. And the chief of staff responded, OK, do you want him up or do you want him down? So I think data is part of it. It has to be reliable data. It has to be accurate data. And it has to be useful data. Right. So Tim gives an interesting perspective. He'll get, I've asked him to please give you a perspective from his time at the FBI and now with his time at uh, Thompson Reuters Special Services supporting a lot of law enforcement entities uh, in that role. Yeah, I, I think it's, Im it's important to understand the context of the challenges I've had, which I think all of you in this room have from the time I was a street agent, GS-14, and come up the ranks of the FBI, especially after 9-11. It seems like I've been fighting this data data fight and in, in, in getting answers at speed um, since that time, so for 17 years, both in and out of government. So if you look at what happened, you know, all of you in this room, if, if your government or even the private sector, something happens, you're held accountable, um, you know, because we weren't able to see and get intel from the data in a timely manner at speed. 
you know, you said I would frequently ask the question, if you remember, I worked for Mueller. Mueller used to always ask those questions. He wanted it yesterday as, a, as opposed to today or tomorrow. Um, but 9-11, all the mistakes that were made in 9-11 leading up to not connecting, as they say, not connecting dots, we, we were all at failure in government. It was a failure of an imagination. Um, in fast forward that time, the Bureau got much better um, with looking at data at speed. Um, however, like every government organization, moved very slowly to put the systems in place, the infrastructure, the architecture, and all the different data feeds you need. And I think there's been great progress made, automated case management systems. Um, but one of the things that the challenge we face is, you know, you fast forward to, if you remember, Ab Ab the underwear bomber, Abdul Mutella, um, you know, flying into Detroit and trying to blow up a plane. Again, a lot of information was missed from the UK government, from our own government, from the intel community, from State Department. And you know, I can remember that day when Director Mueller came back and said, you know, we just came from a, from a meeting and, and I understand that we had a lot of these, not us specifically, but the community had a lot of these dots or a lot of this information, data, that we just weren't able to contextualize to get real-time intelligence and actually connect together. Most of you probably face that on a daily basis, whatever work environment you're in. And I remember specifically, I'll never forget, the director asked me, that then I was the number three in the bureau, head of all, um, you know, basically uh, infrastructure, IT, security, data. And he asked me, um, you know, the problem is I hear a lot of these agencies have multiple databases. How many databases do we have? And I couldn't even answer the question. And here I was supposedly trying to run it, right? So we did quickly, uh, under Director Mueller, you worked quickly, and, and we figured out we had actually hundreds of databases that didn't talk to each other. And so part of the solution there, and I think it is, is a lesson for everybody in this room and, and all of us in the organization, you have to find out what you own, and then you have to find out um, what's important. Out of those hundreds of databases we had, 13 we found were used in 80% of all our investigations. So we quickly, in a nine-month period, put a team together and created something we called a digital integration visualization system using platforms, uh, SAP-like, in the right data streams, and we allowed our investigators and analysts to look in real time for connecting 13 different of the most important databases in the organization. Remember, you gotta, you gotta do what you can um, at scale and at time. Um, we discounted and got rid of a lot of the databases that were out there, created for all sorts of good reasons. Um, people and organizations create databases for a specific use case to solve a problem, and many times then it just goes away or, away or sit there. So I would say uh, to your question, Government's gotten much better. You all have gotten much better. But now, contrast that, I went to New York and worked uh, four years on Wall Street in the business community, and now I run a national security company, a small startup here in, in Virginia. The, the private sector faces the same, same problems as you do. Um, different, but they have supply chain issues. They have insider threat and risk on their own intellectual property. So we're all in this fight together. Um, what I would ask as everybody goes forward is I've tried to keep a very open mind um, about what's out there. And there's, there's a lot of technology out there today that can look at unstructured and structured data, um, and put it together on a platform and give you data-driven intelligence at speed. We just have to, in this room and in government, and those that help serve government, um, think how do we do this, how can we scale it, and how can we get, to, get it to you so you can help solve those problems. Thank you. So Dawn, from a CBP perspective, data-driven intelligence. Uh, I'm basically, a, a, have oversight of a reporting and analytics system at CBP. So I would say my definition has really changed over time. If you asked me that question eight to 10 years ago, I would have said, it was a, a central centralized system where I took um, data from a lot of my different databases across CBP for what is the Office of Field Operations, which is all the port of entries out there, air, land, and sea, and created metrics and measures around it, um, giving our users the ability to di um, drill down to the transactional detail. So that's what we did about eight years ago. That was the start of our relationship with SAP. And we also created a second environment that allowed all of our users to do customized reports and automate them and be able to email them out to your, to your users, be it someone inside of your agency or outside of your agency. So that, that was eight years ago. And that really served us well for, I would say, about five to six years. And, and if I would say my definition now, my definition now is, Take, taking that environment we have and expanding it to include more metrics and a lot more detailed data. But more importantly, now we're linking it so we have an entire process flow. So for something like CBP, it's important for us to be able to follow someone who's a traveler if they're entering at a port of entry on primary 
Um, then they get referred to secondary, then they have some type of law enforcement action against them. We want to see that entire process flow because we collect different bits of information along the way and being able to see that full flow is really important to us. Um, secondly, right now, one of the largest things we're up against is being able to figure out how to visualize that data. Um, we, you know, and how do we make our dashboards more robust? I mean, the, the visuals in and of itself, because we cover so much ground, that, that's a challenge to us right now. Um, and then I would say, if, if I talked about the future, it would be taking this process flow and from our side, it would be attaching the traveler history that we have in another system, then attaching our biometrics, which we're now collecting, and maybe even dropping in social media. But I, I'm not there yet. <laughs> but th that, that, you know, it changes over time with technology and w with opportunities. So I'm going to transition because, again, I, I told you the composition of this audience is mostly federal agencies, so I also going to ask the panelists to give you an example in their world. How is data changing and enhancing their environment? I will tell you before they start to answer. I was in headquarters. I spent half my career as a uniformed officer in the field, came to headquarters for five years, became a headquarters lifer, never left. So I happened to be here when 9-11 happened. And Commissioner Bonner was our commissioner at the time. And as the expression goes, does the moment make the person or does the person make the moment? Having lived there, I think like Sully made the moment, I think Commissioner Bonner made the moment. We had five priorities. We were turning into a brand new agency, becoming part of DHS from Legacy Customs. Five priorities. One of them was advanced data. Technically, CBP or Legacy Customs never shut the border down on 9-11. But the process became so slow we were backing cars up to Mexico City along the southwest border. We were backing up commercial. Uh, and as you know, most automotives, automobiles are made with components from Canada. Those were being backed up all the way up into Canada. And it was all because we didn't have the sufficient data to make intelligent decisions. So as that is an example, how are you using data to make intelligent decisions? Uh, in, in our case, our mission is to help people change. Uh, we deal with people who have been charged or convicted of federal crimes, and that could be anything from stealing eagle feathers in Alaska to smuggling drugs into Miami. Uh, so there's a lot of diversity in the population we deal with, but the concept of changing behavior is a universal one. Um, and we had a lot of data. We have about 300,000 cases a year that we work with. Um, and what we used, with the particular data analytic tools, um, and again, I couldn't imagine operating uh, without them at this point, uh, to identify tools, uh, risk assessment tools, for example. We can stratify people based on the risks they present for recidivism and their needs. What treatment needs do they have? Um, because again, we have a lot of information related to their criminal history, their medical history, their education, their family history. We have all that. We couldn't harness it historically. We would rely on anecdotal assessments and case-by-case -case assessments. Whereas now, with the technology, we're able to leverage it on a larger scale and have an, a degree of institutional knowledge that goes both up the organization and down to the individual officers who are handling an individual case. And they're able to make better decisions at the case level. And us here in DC are able to make funding decisions that are more informed. Uh, we're also able to make policy uh, decisions that are more effective as well. And what we're able to show uh, for the first time in our systems history, we're able to document recidivism among federal offenders is substantially down. And what that translates to, there are people walking this earth right now that wouldn't have been but for the interventions we're now using. And that is an absolutely wonderful feeling. Um, and I think other agencies are doing the same things, and it's very, very exciting. Exactly. So Tim, from the FBI, or even from any other agency that you may have been supporting over the last several years. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'll go back to the, the original premise. I think the government has done a very good job, CBP, courts, FBI, DHS, the intel community, at, at finding the data within their own organization and building systems with, with the help of, of outside individuals or sometimes internal groups um, to, to connect all that information. In, in the Bureau, it's, it's, it's investigations um, connecting with SIGINT and human right behind the firewall and, and having that inform people in real time. Um, and the systems are there and they're built and they were because of the tragic events of 9-11 and all the other terrorist events and everything else. 
I think, uh, to me, one of the most important things we're starting to see across the community um, and in government and whole, and it doesn't have to be the law enforcement, um, it, it can be in just general services, whether it's uh, Social Security or HHS and, and the like, is people are starting to realize, and what I've seen in the time that I've left, that 80% of the intel um, is in the open. It's either in proprietary databases around the world, it's in social media, it's in dark web, the world has changed. And so the old days of one time I was in the bureau that we had everything and we kept it behind a firewall, um, SIGINT and HUMANT and other collection activity, um, that doesn't tell the whole story anymore. And, and I think what we're seeing at um, the line level and a GS-15 level and first line SES is, is they're getting it. There's some, some of them are from a different generation. They're getting that, that the intel is, is in the wild and you need that to fulfill the landscape of risk for your organization, not only in government but in the private sector as well. And I think that is the next stage. You were talking about some of it at, at CBP. That's the next stage because I still think at this day government's missing a lot of the intel because they're not able to get the data or they do not even know that the data exists worldwide in the business community, in the compliance community, um, in news feeds and the like that can actually feed your organization in real time. And it's not that difficult to do. We just need a greater awareness that it's right. out there. So Dawn, um, how's the data making you smarter? I, I would <laughs> say I'll name three things off the top of my head really quickly. Um, CBP is an agency that has a, a within Office of Field Operations, a workload staffing model where we look at all of our volume, our volume data and our targeting as well as our enforcement activities and we use it to do, you know, to make intelligent decisions about our resource allocation and to reach out to Congress and request more officers in Office of Field Operations. Um, another area that Al kind of touched on a little is our automated targeting systems. Um, they take a wide range of data and, and, and use it in quite complex ways to help officers who are out there um, make decisions on holding cargo or you know, referring people to secondary. So, and those systems have been for, around for a while. And th those are kind of big examples, but I mean, we use data at a smaller example. Um, off, if I could talk to you about what we call ready lanes. So if you're going through a port of entry in a car um, from Canada or the US, um, 10 years ago you would not see a sign that said ready lane. But now when you're going through the border, um, our lanes are divided up and one of them is called ready lanes. And what ready lanes are is if you have a document that has an RFID chip in it, it's readable now. So when you're pulling up, at first when we did it, we had the chips right at the booths and then we moved them back three or four cars depending on the facility and for the first time our officers had advanced information in the land environment, which is really important for an officer. Um, secondly, the thing that it did, it, it allowed us to process people much more quickly because as that car was waiting to pull up, you were processing the, these people who had these documents. So um, we're constantly using data in different ways to make decisions about a program or about our operations from really large levels down to the detail. So we did terms of reference. We did some of the probably challenges or utilization of uh, data that each of you in the audience have. So the next one is from a positive to a negative. If, if in a perfect world, you two were king and you were queen, and you get all the data that you ever imagined, what would be some of those challenges with that data? Now, I'm just, while you think through that, because I kind of went slightly off of what I told them I was going to ask them. Yeah. I'll, I'll just give you something. For me, it was when I was at the agency, CBP, we didn't have the computing capability to handle it. So it was clearly be careful what you ask for because you may get it. And then if you get it, the one thing that keeps law enforcement up at night is that nobody connected the dots, something bad happens, and you had the data. But you couldn't act upon the data. So what we did, I actually asked, and SAP was gracious enough, we said, well, who does it really well? Under Armour, how cool. They said, you want to go to their corporate office in uh, Baltimore? We said, yeah. So I got other sports fans, and we said, even if we learn <laughs> nothing about data, how cool would that be to be able to tell the family over dinner that, hey, we hung out at Under Armour uh, this afternoon. And it, I say it because it was the video that was just shown. I'm technologically ignorant. I admit that. When people used to come into my office to fix my computer and looked at me like I was stupid, I said, remember, my stupidity creates job security for you. So you want stupid people like me. 
to unplug and plug in my computer and now say, sir, it now works. So we go up to Under Armour, and I've been hearing from the people at CVP, oh, well, no, this is too expensive, this is cheaper, this is better, a dupe, Hannah, and I had no idea what the difference. Graciously, the data scientist for Under Armour gave us a simple example, and he said, you need both. He said, in real simple terms, and I'll let the SAP people clarify if I'm like, uh, uh, like not representing Hannah correctly, but for me it was perfect. He said, you want to search a six drawer file cabinet. A dupe is really for storing data, but he told me, but if you want to search something, you have to, that's going to search each drawer individually. So if your information is in the bottom drawer, it's going to take you a certain amount of time. Hannah will search the whole thing simultaneously. So it'll basically create light speed for you. So that was our challenge. We're still struggling, or they're still struggling, while well, I'm retired thinking about their challenges. But what other challenges would you say in a perfect world that some of the audience may resonate with as far as if you get what you want, now what are you going to do with it? Yeah, I, I think for, for me what pops into my mind is the idea that you know, information is great, but too much information is maybe just as much of a problem as having no information. So how do you convey that information to the person who needs it in a way that are best going to understand it? And how I understand information may be different than how Tim understands it. So the data display and the mechanism in which it's displayed is just as important as the information itself, which is just as important as the information being accurate. So I think the time and effort, and it would be well worth it, um, to address those issues would be key to the success of having all the information we would want. We have plenty of information now. Uh, some of it is how do we distinguish meaningful information from non-meaningful information. Uh, I gave the example with Dawn talking earlier. If I left my job today, that may be an indicator that I'm losing stability, I'm about to tailspin back into criminal activity. For Dawn, it may not be a problem at all. It may mean she's going on to another job and going to be successful. How do we distinguish that when you're looking at data related to 300,000 people? Uh, right. I think those are the challenges. Tim. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I would agree that I think there's, we're overwhelmed with data, right? We have vast data and, and what, what, the, what, how do you scale it? How do you scale unstructured, structured data and, and the inter interconnectivity of the relationships around people, places and things? That's really it in a nutshell and I think for every agency and every institution, you have to decide what data set actually fulfills that gap of the intel um, or the mission space that you're in. Um, Difficult to do in many ways, but you guys know your business. You can say, you can look at your problem and say, I need this, this, and this, and now where do I go find it? Sometimes you don't even know it's available. That's why I talk about keeping an open mind, keeping on the cutting edge and looking out at data source, because in this environment, in a flat world, in a technology environment, um, people are aggregating data every day that we don't even know about, sometimes on us. We often worry about government, but the private sector is collecting. You look at the Googles, you look at the Facebooks and everything that's going on in the space, um, collecting a lot of data out there. Um, I look at everything, um, for lack of a better word, is supply chain. DOD, works largest purchase in the world, looks at supply chain. Every government agency in here looks at supply chain. But they think of supply chain just as that. Companies, um, either how do I get the supplies, the risk with a uh, certain vendor or supplier, um, the risk that they may bring. But I look at everything, whether it's people, places, or things, as a supply chain. Everything's got its beginning and end, and I think government has to map out what are those gaps that we want to know about those people, places, and things, and where can we get that data to fulfill it? How can we put the analytic tools on top of it to get the answers we need in real time? Now, today, that's not hard to do. When I was coming up, that was hard to do. Some of the technology was just being developed. Some of the data wasn't available. Um, I've seen it in the, in the private sector and working with government today. It's there. We just got to wrap our heads around it. Dawn, your perspective? Huh. I would say for, for CBP and in particular OFO, for us, it has been and it's always going to be dealing with really large, complex data sets. I mean, if you talk about OFO in and of itself, it's anti-terrorism, it's immigration, it's trade compliance, it's um, agricultural prote you know, protection. It's At the same time, you're trying to bring about lawful travel and trade. And those, those data sets are huge data sets. Um, and the tar targeting aspects, the enforcement, um, oop, they're really large. So one of the ways we've kind of deal with it, in a sense we have, I would say, three genres of information systems. We have um, processing systems where we're processing the travelers 
and, and the cargo. We have targeting systems where we do the targeting. And over the last five to 15 years, we've been standing up um, analytics and reporting systems that take key variables from a lot of these systems, as well as some of the transactional detail and create metrics around it. And that's kind of one of the ways we've dealt with the challenge of large data sets and the complexity. I would also say, I mean, I've said it and they've said it right now, being able to visualize it in a good way, that, that's our challenge right now. Um, for our agency, our, our, my users can be an officer in the field, it can be his management, it can be a program manager at headquarters, um, our senior management, it can be DHS, it, it could be any one of our OFO stakeholders from an airline industry to um, any of our commercial trade clients. And we also have our, you know, our political stakeholders from Congress to GAO, OMB. So for us, it's you know, getting all that data in the one place and being able to access it and present it in a way that makes sense. And that, that's probably going to continue to be our, our challenge for the next few years, because I think we have the technology in place to do it now. And we're starting to do it, but being able to do it across the whole agency, given our mission space, it, it's going to be a, a, a challenge <laughs> that we're going to be tackling. Right. So another issue that some of you may have, and this is kind of deviating from what I told them in advance, so it's really I wanted to get Tim's perspective based on something he said. Uh, so Mike, when I was at the agency, it was always, do I have the right data? for data? And is there other data that I should be bringing in to enrich the data that I have that'll make us more predictive? So it's all about means, methods, and tactics. Tradecraft of the criminal element. And you have the known, but then more challenging is the unknown, because generally you do post-seizure analysis. So you know about means, methods, and tactics, and you want to stop that from happening again. But what about the criminal elements and their means, methods, and tactics that you never stopped? So in CBP, Dawn has organic data. She has customs data. She has law enforcement data of the seizures made. She has high side classified data. But what about commercial data? You got your big three out there. Thomson Reuters, Dun & Bradstreet, LexisNexis. So do each of you, if you were briefing out to your superiors, would you be able to say you have all the data that you need, and you've already done your due diligence in determining that there's no other commercial data that could actually make you smarter in what you're doing. So I'll ask Tim, only because he was at the FBI, I just named one of the companies he works with for Thompson Reuters, and then I'll ask Matt or Dawn if they want to also comment. No, I think well, I think your comment is, is spot on. It doesn't it doesn't matter which provider. There are some the Bloomberg's of the world and some of the others that that you mentioned, and, and certainly Thompson Reuters, the, the parent company that owns our the, the company we have. Um, there is the, a richness of worldwide business data and people data out there that I don't think um, in in government when I was in I didn't appreciate as much as I appreciate Neither today. Did I. Um, and I think frequently in, in government, and that's why I applaud many of you for coming to this, because this is where it starts. Um, there's, I've seen, since I've left and when I was in, I see pockets of brilliance that understand this to a degree. And they're, they're pushing this rock uphill um, to get the whole organization behind it, to be able to fund it, and to get the contract mechanisms in place, um, to be able to provide this data to give them, give them organization uplift. Um, so it, you just really have to be on the cutting edge, or your team has to be on the cutting edge. You have to be continually sourcing, um, you know, different data sets from outside the organization um, because it's much more rich than anything you have internally. What I found in, in the government is frequently, um, because of all the different policies and procedures, we'd give an analyst, um, you know, a certain tool, give them certain data sets, and tell them to solve a problem that was unsolvable with what we just gave them. Right. Right. Because we're not thinking broad enough, and you, and you see more of this in the private sector where they actually allow you to expand um, your reach to solve the problems with anything you need, and I think that's where we need to get government. Right. I'm going to deviate. You, you can't see it. There's this big clock here, <laughs> and it's ticking. It feels like I'm testifying under hell, right. and that, like, it just shuts you off. As, so we're down to two minutes and 50 seconds and counting. So I will finish with I want each of them to bestow on you 
from their perspective, where do they see big data taking their environment into the future? Or if they were king and queen for the day, what would they want relative to big data? Yeah, I think for us it would be the ability to integrate information from multiple sources. The users don't care where it comes from as long as it's reliable. Um, and we, I spoke to someone earlier, video information, audio information, text information, the ability to integrate all that and use it. Uh, we're now, for the most part, most of our information I think is text or fields based. The ability of grabbing those other sources, particularly video and audio, I think reduces data entry, those kind of things. I think that would be, uh, the, for us, it would be an exciting future. Right. Tim? I'll give it to well, I was going to say, for the, off the top of my head, the biggest thing that will make a difference for us is we're doing what we call biometric pilots at the moment. So we are using facial recognition technology up in the cloud so that as you're entering in an air environment at the moment and we're doing some exit pilots as well, it's using your face to recognize you. Um, and it's throwing that information up in front of the officer so he can confirm it. And one of the big benefits to that is that officer can do that and he's no longer just concentrating on data in front of him because that facial recognition has recognized you, he can concentrate on asking questions and he can concentrate on the other data. So, um, you know, having more data is definitely there, but the other technologies as well, the facial recognition, it, that's, that's gonna change the way we as an agency operate as we figure out how to do that in larger environments, a, a land environment. It, it, or it's going to make a large difference. <laughs> Great. Tim? Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to that, because I agree with everything that's said, is that you must demand um, the scalability, looking at all your, your, your data, but also in today's world um, with SAP and other companies, natural language processing, right? You need to be able to ask this data questions in a normal way as opposed to having a coder or a programmer or someone writing scripts all the time. We're still at that stage. We're not quite through that yet, but there's a lot of capabilities out there for natural language processing where you ask the data questions and it returns what you're looking for, at least gives you a realm of what you're looking for. Right. The only thing I would add, I feel like I'm on HGTV, uh, Iron Chef, I got 15 seconds, prepare the plates, yeah. and then I step away is machine learning. I really believe artificial intelligence, the sheer volume of activity, at least from my perspective, millions of people coming in, tens of millions of pieces of cargo. CBP's role for national security is also to protect economic security, economic prosperity of this country. And so if you have legitimate travelers wanting to come and go in and out of the country, you have to be able to do it at speed. There is no, yeah. there is no alternative. And so with that, thank you all very much. Appreciate your attention. Thank you.